Excellent. Thank you very much, Mia. And thank you really to all of our panelists for agreeing to be here. Um, for everyone in the audience, we'd love it if you keep popping questions into the chat and we'll continue to monitor that. But to kick us off, we've got a question from Kathy Astor, which is quite specific um, for Davy. Uh, she's interested in hearing a bit about the successes and challenges with importing and displaying IIIF images in an Omega S instance. But I think for all of our panelists, it might be worth considering challenges around sort of displaying your research, presenting your research in whatever way you choose to go about that. So Davy, why don't we kick off with you, but then everyone else feel free to chime in. So could, I didn't see the question in the Q&A. Could you just uh, briefly uh, repeat? So to repeat, uh, our attendee is interested in hearing a little more about successes and challenges with importing and displaying IIIF images in an Omega S context or really in any context to present or display research. Yeah. Um, well, with um, so I presented two projects with the Amica uh, project. We actually um, produced our own IIIF manifest. So all the students uh, that were working on the Amica project, they uploaded their um, images. And so we produced with the IIIF module um, the IIIF manifests. Um, now with the old stories uh, app, maybe some people will know that uh, you, you had to give uh, the IIIF manifest. Now it will be generated um, by, the, by the app. Um, but um, so we, we added the IIIF module. Now the Madoc, Madoc uh, project. So Madoc, the software is Omica based, um, but the, um, uh, so it makes for a full IIIF compatibility. Um, so within Omica, and this is actually, it is Omica as based, but with the second project, so the Congolese Comics uh, project, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't expect any issues uh, with uh, this communication um, because it's fully uh, IIIF based. Um, so we will also be moving away from the uh, Omica S um, for, the, for the users. Um, so, I don't know if this partially answers the um, the question, um, but again, for the for the second project, we will be um, uh, moving away from this Omica environment. It's, it's, it's very interesting. If I could chip in, that the um, uh, I think what's come out from the discussion so far is the variety of use cases that there might be and the different types of audiences that there would be. And I think that maybe for the more detailed, um, uh, very niche research that I or possibly Pierre uh, would want to undertake, at this stage, um, it's difficult to envisage presenting that other um, than via conventional uh, scholarly means, publication. Um, and it's it there, there isn't the you can see the possibilities of IIIF to present that research, but you'd kind of either need to set up a very specific project which a particular piece of research might not warrant, um, or um, uh, uh, you'd have to go down I think a conventional route. It's it's kind of not quite maybe there yet um, that you could readily present a piece of research without setting up a very specific project. What would you need, Andrew, to, in order to have that sort of display that you're looking well, for? Well, I, I mean, in particular case, uh, the very small piece of research that I did, but it was interesting because it actually reappraised the relationship with some manuscripts. The first thing I would need, and, and Mia's discussed the reasons for that, would be to actually have all the manuscripts that I was interested in in a AAA format. And that usually, that's the main buffer that you hit. You can usually go along quite nicely, a similar work with some uh, in the Chaucer manuscripts. You can go along quite nicely with two or three manuscripts, then you find you want to relate it to a fourth, and you find that's not available in the IIIF form. Um, it may be digitized, but it's not uh, available in the IIIF form. That's a very frequent buffer, I think, you hit at the moment from a research point of view. Andrew, you'll be glad to know that it's happening, but it's happening in library time, which is measured in yeah, no, years, it's, not it's, months. It's, uh, it's understandable what a huge 
uh, undertaking it is to retrospectively convert huge quantities of digital data that the library generated. So I think everyone's aware of that, but it, it does limit what you can do from a research point of view at this stage. I don't suppose there'd be any way of sort of uh, setting up a wish list, <laughs> any way of organizing the priorities for digitization. As if we've got, Believe uh, me, there's well, already an internal. <laughs> <laughs> As I assume there would be. Uh, <laughs> who, who, who wants which, which image to deal with first? And the quantities, the quantities are enormous because I mean, actually the, the resource I use most is one that has material from the National Archives uh, on and that holds something like 15 million images. So I don't know whether that would ever be available in the AAA format. And it, it harks back to what we were talking about, that Tom was talking about, about the need for industrial scale implementation as well. Tom, would you like to follow that on? Uh, yep, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm not a panelist, but <laughs> uh, well, well, yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's the, the the balance between small scale stuff and industrial stuff. But also, I think I mean the biggest thing is tools. You know, the in that sense, Triple Life is in its infancy. It's a project. You know, it's a, an enterprise undertaken by organisations that generally don't have a lot of funding <laughs> so, uh, to to develop the kinds of complex software that people expect to be able to use. You know, if you it's like we're as if we were all talking about making presentations for each other, but no one had invented PowerPoint or Google Slides, and we were trying to cobble it all together ourselves every time we gave a presentation. You know, you kind of want to remove all the technical. You know, no one talks about the technical underpinnings or the file formats when they're making a PowerPoint presentation. Eventually, Triple F should be the same. It's just oh, it's Triple F. Therefore, I can use it in this tool, and this tool, and this tool, and pick whatever one you want. And it's just the very early stages of that. Um, yeah, it needs. It needs time and money spent on tooling. I think there's a broader issue as well in terms of um, thinking in terms of like service design style user journeys, where sometimes I know an institution has done something with AAAF, but it's difficult to find those collections. And I know from the British Library's catalogue, um, people miss the cues in the labels and the faceted um, aspects of the catalogue that let them know that items are available for digitized items are available outside the reading room. Um, so it really takes a commitment across the organization to not only do all that infrastructure work to get your collection digitized items into AAAF, um, to have some kind of viewer to update your catalog, but also to think in terms of how do you let everyone know that your collections are available in this amazing format that can be used in so many creative ways. Maybe, maybe they're indexed in a national collection, possibly. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, I can um, comment a little bit about that um, in terms of user journeys and visual cues. In the IIIF community, as part of the uh, Discovery for Humans working group, um, we're in the process of conducting original user research. Um, and that will be presented actually um, in two weeks at the annual IIIF conference. So everyone should tune into that. Um, but it's absolutely true that um, users themselves need cues and, and even a, a working mental model of what IIIF is and what it can do. And a lot of times the, the current generation of implementations has, it's an afterthought uh, at, at most, right? And so we, we're starting to see some emerging patterns that are more familiar to users. And um, I think there's a lot of room for improvement in that usability uh, arena. That, that's as much, that's in my experience as a user, that's as much often a question of smaller archives who've got quite limited um, implementation of IIIF rather than you can usually, if you're determined enough, wrestle it out with what's going on with a big collection like the British Library. Um, and one, as Maya says, one gets used to the cues. But in smaller collections, it can be very frustrating because you can think you're in a fully triple IF um, environment, then you try and do something that you expect to be able to do, and you find you can't, and you dig down and you can see that the implementation has been slightly peculiar for some reason. Um, 
uh, and and that's often in much smaller, very small collections uh, and institutions. Is that possibly an argument for some sort of standard way of displaying AAAF content, whether that be at a national level? Well, we are proud towards a national collection, or even just the how far outside. And it would be interesting to hear the view of the other panelists. How far outside the sort of large institutions that we've got represented here? How far there's a genuine commitment to the open aspects of IIIF, um, and whether there are smaller institutions that are just doing it for uh, uh, internal uh, housekeeping reasons, who don't necessarily want to see the um, uh, images shared in the way that uh, was implicit in IIIF. I think I'm just picking up on a question in the Q&A about the relationship between open access and IIIF. Um, because IIIF was built with the understanding that sometimes you need to put limitations on access, it actually enables more access than another tool might because people feel confident that they can put parameters on where they need to, either in terms of um, you know, welcome, you need to log in for certain materials so that they can give you terms and conditions about material related to living memory um, or um, resolutions um, of images available. So I think that because IIIF presents an understanding of the institutional context and the institutional fears about what happens if we're too open, um, it can actually enable more than um, things which are just like everything is open. It's, it allows for more shades of gray and that can be really necessary. also facilitates the institutions to be able to keep track of how the images are used. I mean, this speaks to a justification of resources as well, because if, if you say, well, we're going to spend all of this money on presenting these in IIIF, and then you can actually point and say, well, the resources are being used. They're being used for research. They're being used for engagement. Um, like right down to which bit of an image is being searched for um, can be potentially quite useful. Yeah, right. One uh, additional sure. comment I can make is that uh, as we're thinking about standards or guidelines in the IIIF community for how to present the resources, it, it's an open source community with many, you know, it's a consortium of institutions, right? So it's very hard to disseminate any, anything close to a rule. Whereas something like a national collection can unify and standardize and present in a single interface, right? Um, just like Google does, uh, a certain way of getting at those um, resources. And so that's maybe one of the benefits of building a national collection, a national interface, is that you can provide that standard even when you can't necessarily get all the institutions to adopt the same standards. I suppose that depends what you mean by a national collection in the first place um, in a multi-nation entity or a multi-country entity like the British. I mean, a lot of my material would want to link to uh, something like the Paul Mellon in America or to natural history collections in Europe. I think it's got to be about crossing borders as much as creating entities. Within the, the wider tank or towards the national collection discussion, trying to discuss what national collection meant in the earlier stages went round and round and round. And I think it was generally agreed that it was looking more about collections of national interest as opposed to collections of national things. So speaking of how collections connected to the wider world became very important in telling the story of the collections that may just happen to be in the United Kingdom or Great Britain at the moment. Um, so that, that was recognised and highlighted as being a topic that would require further discussion. Um, the issue being initially that Towards the National Collection was a UK funded academic stream. So the focus did need to be at least primarily uh, on the UK.
I mean, all right. Um, so before this question, and maybe I'm just one. checking the Q&A very quickly. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to contribute about the idea about open access and IIIF and how those interact either in their own research or things they would like to see in the future? All right, it seems like there's nothing else from any of our panelists that they'd like to contribute. So before the panel today, uh, we as a project had a few questions that we sent out to our panelists for them to have some thoughts about perhaps uh, prior to the discussion. And one of the ones that I'd like to pick up at this point is what role do you see IIIF in post-capture enrichment workflows like machine learning or crowdsourcing? Do you see further potential there? Maybe I want to comment on that. Um, be great something I've been thinking about, but so I primarily think from this educational perspective. So I'm setting up student projects. Now, if I would sum up um, all the projects that are being done yearly at our university with, for example, the library, uh, with our own collection of our university library, that, that's a huge amount of, of work being, being done. So if you would have this feedback loop of, for example, student projects in coordination with, for example, the library, you would have these enriched collections. So it can be an extra argument and, and our own university uh, library uh, is using IIIF, but also for smaller collections when they're We've been talking about scattered collections, about smaller institutions. Um, I think Marianne was talking about the, the narrative so that you can um, have objects from some small institution, museum, whatever. It can be an extra argument for them as well to know, and it's something uh, Joseph said as well, to know that their material is being worked with if you have this feedback loop. So for example, with Maddox, we can um, we can uh, produce the, the new manifest, so the enriched manifests, which can be integrated in those uh, collections if they adopt a standard, of course. Um, but again, it, it, it makes visible that their collection is being worked with um, online and not just some paper that is uh, written once and uh, never read again. So I think this is really something that can, and it's something that I don't know that is being done right now, but something that can really um, make for an, a new relationship between teaching practices and libraries and collections um, using IIIF and in uh, my case, uh, the Maddox uh, platform. But maybe I'm being too optimistic and too ambitious and maybe the consultation won't be as, uh, as easy as I uh, envision it, but who knows? No, no, not at all. I don't think you're being too optimistic at all, Davy. I, I really think that's part of the creating those new dialogues um, and new ways of working is part of the excitement of IIIF. Um, though I think the question is how we we fit that to different audiences um, and how, how that differently works in. But Anne's question to us is also raising deeper questions. I think crowdsourcing, yes, there's a lot of potential there. But around machine learning and so on, there, there definitely has to be potential when we start to develop um, large scale corpora of the sort that Dave is describing. There are the possibilities of do, dealing with approaches to collections in ways that we haven't yet done. And um, uh, in a sense, I wonder whether we've actually imagined enough of that yet and whether we need to, uh, um, we, we need to be thinking about how we might work with the collections very differently in that in the sort of context that David described for us. I think for me, the um, uh, at the library, I was the first client of our um, IIIF content. I used the um, manifest from the Playbills collection, which were digitized from microfilm um, to build in the spotlight. So um that's kind of natively IIIF in a way and we store the resulting transcriptions and um marked up regions as w3c annotations um and using the IIIF manifests allowed us to um use those high quality images without having to store them separately which would have added platform costs so even sort of to that extent it made life 
easier. Um, at the moment, I'm trying to see if it's possible to import, to use those IIIF manifests in Zooniverse because that would enable further work too. Um, but I think there's a wider issue again in that um, if we are doing things like crowdsourcing, you'll have annotations created in different contexts um, to different levels of quality, because that's always the first question that people ask about crowdsourcing. You know, how you define quality depends entirely on your goals. Um, so thinking about systems that know about your collections data, not only in terms of directing people to online versions of content, but also in terms of understanding where there are crowdsourced annotations, where there are machine learning created annotations as well. Um, because a lot of the machine learning image classifiers, for example, will produce image uh, terms that just aren't appropriate for um, these sort of older and more culturally varied collections. They tend to have a very 20th century North American West Coast idea of what things are. Um, sorry, 21st century. Um, so I think there is a need for um, greater AAA literacy and awareness in some of the systems that we use to really make the most of the content that we get because I think context clash could be quite, um, it's not a worry, but say um, Andrew's need as a scholar to compare different manuscripts, his annotations in that context aren't necessarily of interest to others who are looking at different aspects of those collections and he might not want to share what he's working on. Um, but having systems that really in a very embedded, sustainable way um, understand what AAAF is and what the potential of it could be is kind of key to helping it succeed. I, I would just jump in here and say the work that the National Library of Wales has done with crowdsourcing um, has done two really wonderful things. One is it's produced, it produces masses of data on things like place names which is hugely valuable for the scholarly community and for big data crunching. I mean, more and more humanities projects need vast amounts of data in order to tackle research questions um, in, in a variety of ways. But then the other thing it actually does is it creates a community of volunteers who are local people, as Jason says, working often through their native language. And when I'm hoping to set up a crowdsourcing project on the pennant manuscripts and the pennant pictures to actually get local input into that building, um, that river, that bridge would for me be a really exciting result. And to, to kind of feel things coming from the inside from a human point of view, as well as that massive, wonderful, exciting, um, big data that you can do so much with as well. So I think as Joseph just said, you know, one operation allows you to go in very, very different directions from the local to the, the global. Um, and I think that some of the things that you, you've you said this afternoon really bring that home to me. So yeah, so thank you. All right. We have... Oh, <laughs> go ahead, Mia. Uh, I was gonna say, um, I think the th you know, things like place names, um, another project I work on is Living With Machines, which is, broadly data science meets digital history applied to digitized newspapers and other sources at scale. Um, and some of the wonderful computational linguists on that are doing toponym resolution, um, linking to Wikidata. So really creating robust records, um, but those records exist for a tiny subset of the digitized books or digitized newspaper pages that we have. Um, so thinking about what that means in terms of the lumpiness of the experience where some um, items that have been looked at in a great amount of detail, either by scholars, crowdsources, computers in some combination will have really, really detailed information that um, the systems that we have can't support that level of granularity in terms of discovering that content. Um, but we do need to think about how we'll work at um, when we have material that has been annotated or looked at more heavily than, than other material, um, because it ultimately it will start to skew the user experience in some perhaps unexpected ways. Um, you know, we're aware of the canonization of 
or the recanonization of things that are digitized and how that makes them more prominent in scholarship. So I think knowing that that might happen, we could think about how to prevent that happening again um, with that kind of AAA FFI'd attention that might happen. Really good point, Mia. Andrew's got a very good paper on how digitizing a whole bunch of texts actually produces rather skewed results in um, searches for various things is really it's a really good example of exactly that but yeah thank you speaking of uh kind of working at scale we had a question in the chat from Yvonne Lewis asking us to what extent will existing commercial microfilming or digitization projects restrict what could be made available in AAA format for example, there's been quite a bit of heated discussion in the research community about the quality of 18th century text on the early English books online. Ben, I know you work with a lot of film and microfilmed materials. Is this something you've run into? You're asking me? Well, you're a microfilm guy. I'm involved in the, um, the web presentation and the metadata preparation, but not the actual digitization. So yeah, I couldn't comment well on that. I think a lot of that may be an issue of who funded the digitization in the first place. Uh, I think uh, we're not really going to get into it now because we're going to have separate discussions about it in the future, but the whole issue of IPR and licenses and all this kind of stuff around the use of IIIF is, is going to be a big issue for future discussion. Um, uh, Pia, I think you have a great question. Would you like to ask it? Yeah, I was just like um, commenting on what um, Joseph wrote in the chat that IIIF you store once and use it many times, but that is right um, as long as you just use the images like on the web. But um, if you annotate and um, you are trying to, sorry, I got lost there. <laughs> no, for me, it was very attractive to not have to get the pictures because that is a lot of money that I just don't have. So that seemed great. But then you realize, no, if I want to do annotation and somebody moves their pictures in the institutions. And I think we have heard today how different approaches there are in institutions to IIIF and storage and preservation, yep. then my annotations are lost, broken, because um, the canvas region is just not there anymore. So I still have to um, store the pictures locally right now. And that is, for me, it's a huge problem. But maybe not. Maybe somebody has an answer to that. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> I think there's a few ways of thinking about that issue. And one is um, I've been involved in discussions about manuscript identifiers and the use cases that people come up with are things like someone sells a manuscript to another institution or an institution merges or closes. So the domain name at which it's um, located changes. Um, I can't think of many reasons why a shelf mark or a, um, a sort of reference code might change, but that's obviously possible yes, too. Yeah. Or the URL. If yeah, just the URL and, changes, then it's gone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then that is, you know, it's a known, the item has moved and there's ways of forwarding things. And particularly if there was a central system of identifiers, there's also an issue with um, cultural institutions aren't always brilliant at retaining their own memory. Finding information about past exhibitions um, can be very difficult, past events. Um, so and past partnership projects as well, because it can be difficult to sustain them over time. They might guarantee they'll be around for 10 years. And if you annotate on the ninth year and go to look at it again on the 11th year, you may be out of luck. Um, so again, I think we've seen the pendulum swing in terms of supporting or letting national infrastructure wither, but I'd hope that that would be where understanding the vital role of these items in a kind of national collection would mean that they are discoverable and sustainable, regardless of whether they've moved or the institution has changed in the long term. But that, again, takes work and an investment. May I ask something about that? Maybe I haven't understood well what the um, national collection is trying to do. Is it something 
um, similar to the Handschriftenportal in Germany, like for manuscripts only, but yeah, because I that would still mean that the the actual images and the objects still lie with the institutions. And I think that came up earlier that it's very difficult to get all of these institutions to work in the same way or to commit to the same rules. But that's just an outsider perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't speak exactly towards what form the national collection will take. Um, I don't think we know that yet. Um, the hand still towards it, in Germany is incredible. Um, it's a phenomenal initiative and incredibly useful. Um, I think we could aspire to being as useful. Um, though obviously there's additional challenges when you're thinking about things that are not just manuscripts. How do you do this for art galleries and museums and libraries, as well as sort of cultural heritage institutions like Gabira was talking about. I just I just wanted to add one thing here. Um, someone's sort of mentioned it, alluded to it in the chat about whether we needed PIDs for annotations. Uh, persistent identifiers are the focus of one of the other tank foundation projects. Um, and it may well be that Triple IF is shown at the moment as a way of presenting content to the world. How do we share it to everybody? But at the moment, if you're going to carry out academic research, you do this based on published, citable literature, as well as books. So the notion of how we move from images presented in Triple IF simply as being the current presentation from an institution to being research assets that are citable with persistent identifiers is an interesting process. So Pia, you mentioned the notion of Invenio RDM. So at the moment, if you upload an image into Zenodo, it has some IIIF functionality. Uh, we did a little sort of um, experiment in uh, the IIIF project where you can create a manifest for an image that's been uploaded to Zenodo. And it works fine, but you only get about the first 20 tiles because then its rate limiter kicks in and the zooming viewer doesn't work anymore. But technically speaking, you could then you then have a DOI for your image. You have an asset that can be reused. So the notion of saying that if a national collection could act as the referencer for IIIF assets, that could be extremely useful. So if the image moves, the namespace changes, don't care. If your annotations are all based on a non-semantic persistent identifier for that asset, then the image underneath can move around. But this is quite a big infrastructure question. But I think as, as more institutions are wanting to look at their images as research assets, that issue of saying that how we manage them moves away from a digital media focus to actually more of a, how we look after our objects, our paintings, our books, we look after our digital objects the same way that institutions may need to asset and look after digital, made digital works of art. We need to be able to reference them. We need to be able to rely on it and build on this asset. So I think that's a very valid cause for concern. And in our last few minutes, uh, we've got one final question that popped up in the chat, um, asking uh, with regards to Pia's project, but I think it's something that we might have more comments on here. Was there a tension as to the choice between TEI and IIIF for, quote, annotating the materials that you used? I know in my previous role at the Parker Library, we used old TEI and scripted it into mods for a see also field, which is permitted within IIIF. Yeah, how did you address that in your case? I didn't. No, um, I, th <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it. And um, right now, I think I will do without TI um, because um, of the, like the keep it simple approach. So if I, if I choose the annotation in a way that um, um, gets all the visual information that I need for one phenomenon, then I can live with not really directing the text on different parts of this um, annotation. Did I make myself clear? I don't know. But if I come to the um, conclusion that I need this direct um, connection, then I think I have to go with TI. And I uh, think TI, but that maybe that is a naive notion, I don't know, can also help with like finding good tag names 
like you could use that vocabulary for your tags, um, but that's just <laughs> an idea. Okay, we are drawing close to six o'clock. Um, are there any other questions that have prompted by the discussion or anything else that the panel would like to raise? Uh, we do have a few more minutes. Ben, I was People interested by your most recent comment in the chat. Uh, you mentioned that IIIF and the web at large are essentially decentralized in nature. So permanence is an inherent challenge. I think that that's certainly true. I know I've had a few triple IIIF projects that have been broken. Um, would you like to comment on perhaps how you see that challenge being overcome or if that's even possible or desirable? Yeah, it is something I've, I've thought about a little bit in terms of a, kind of an exportable or downloadable triple IIIF object, a local copy. But I think the main, the main thing I can bring up that's useful is the internet archive, archive.org. And I don't know how widely it's used outside of the US, but it is, uh, you know, it's the closest thing to some sort of permanent record, right, um, for, for websites. And so if we think about exporting that model to IIIF, I think right now, yeah, IIIF is not gonna be archivable in that way. Uh, like a work file or an arc file may not fully capture everything about it because there's functionality and JavaScript involved. So hopefully somewhere out there through open source innovation, there becomes uh, a way to store a triple F object. And then hopefully somebody has the willingness to provide the resources to have you know, centralized storage. Maybe it's Wikipedia or Wikidata, right? But right now the challenge is still technical in that you can't really encapsulate a IIIF object without all of its hypertextual references. So archive.org is my, my reference model for now. Is, is that something, Mia, I wonder whether the legal deposit um, teams in, in Britain are addressing or interested in? Which particular aspect, sorry? Uh, 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 the the, the uh, uh, long-term preservation of IIIF objects on the web. Is that sort of thing that legal deposit would cover? Uh, if it's British web content, then yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, the digital preservation and web archiving community tend to share um, sort of work in step together. So hopefully they'd be picking up on the results of things. But one way to test it would be to submit a IIIF enabled website to the web archive and see how it works out. I do think they use it for some of their training. IIIF training is related to assets. The issue is, is that I think those sorts of archives, the speed and responsiveness of any of the images shared would drop drastically. But it might still be okay for checking your annotations and stuff. You can create a, dig a new digital object or a copy of a digital object, and then you can get the IIIF manifest out of it, but you couldn't yeah. ingest a existing IIIF object. Well, and then you run into some issues around copyright as well that I don't think are for us to uh, attempt to tackle or even broach the subject of today. That needs some more legal lines around it. I think broadly there is a point where um, if you're referencing, you know, we know that people will use the online version of an item and then um, write the citation as if they've gone into the library um, because it looks fancy. Um, but I think that particularly as you're using um, collection items that aren't sort of as well known and likely to be around in some form, there should be a way of sort of um, saving it to Zotero or something or saving it to World Archive so that just you've got that backup and evidence for your own scholarship. Um, because if, I don't know, if you're doing a PhD and your examiner says, asks you about an item and it's no longer available online, there should be some way that you can say, well, this is what I saw at the time when I looked. Um, 
you know, luckily I work in a collection that doesn't go into the 20th century really, but increasingly a lot of my research does work with web archives. Um, and I've relied on their archive countless times. And if people can't save items in some way, it does make it harder for them to be embedded in that sort of ecosystem of scholarship. But again, copyright, lots of other issues. Well, I think we are bang on six o'clock. Um, so I think it's probably time to wrap this up and let everyone go to uh, dinner or the pub or wherever it is they're off next to after us. Uh, we would like to thank all of our presenters and our panelists today. Um, it's been a wonderful discussion and we're so lucky that you decided to share your time and expertise with us. Um, as a reminder, you can find us at, at practical triple IF um, on Twitter. And we've had some very dedicated uh, scholars who have been using the hashtag assiduously throughout the presentations today. So if there's something you've missed or like to revisit, you can chat there first. But again, in about a week, we'll be hoping to have that video cut up on YouTube and displayed on our project website as well. Um, thank you all for being here today. And uh, we hope you have a nice evening. Thank you, everyone.